Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one. The thinking atheist. It's not a person. It's a symbol. An idea. The population of atheists in this country is going through the roof. Rejecting faith. Pursuing knowledge. Challenging the sacred. If I tell the truth, it's because I tell the truth. Not because I put my hand on a book and made a wish. And working together for a more rational world. Take the risk of thinking for yourself. Much more happiness, truth, beauty, and wisdom will come to you that way. Assume nothing. Question everything. And start thinking. This is the Thinking Atheist Podcast. Hosted by Seth Andrews. Andrew Seidel is a constitutional attorney. He is a dear friend. He has been on the front lines of sort of the fight for protection of church-state separation. And uh, he joins me here for a conversation about a book that he has that has just released. Now, I want to stop and say I'm, I'm not just here to hawk his book. I want you to buy his book, okay? But I'm here because this is a critical fight. What he is doing, what he has written, what he is endeavoring to accomplish as an attorney and an activist and an author and all these things are part of what you and I are trying to do as well, which is to keep religion from owning the discourse, from dominating, from monopolizing what is supposed to be a church-state separated operation. Andrew Seidel, it's good to have you on the show, my friend. I appreciate you being a part of it. Oh, it is always a pleasure to join you, Seth. Thank you for having me. Let's talk about the founding myth. Just set it up for me, okay? The book and its purpose are what? So the founding myth, why Christian nationalism is un-American, the purpose of this is to utterly destroy the lies and myths that underlie the Christian nationalist identity. Uh, So Christian nationalism, for those who don't know, is the idea that the United States was founded as a Christian nation and that it was founded on Judeo-Christian principles and that it needs to return to those principles. So it's kind of this idea that America has strayed away from its godly origins. And if only we could get back to those godly origins, everything would be fixed. It is not based in history or fact. It's revisionist and it is infecting our politics and our government and even our courts today. What are we talking about? I mean, is this just about Trump right now or is it about a lot more? What are you talking about? I mean, it's certainly about Trump. And Trump, Trump is a prime example of Christian nationalism's power. So b- before the 2016 election, really, Christian nationalism was, was on the fringes of the conservative political movement and on the fringes of the conservative Christian movement. It hadn't really gained any political power. That changed in the 2016 election. Donald Trump rode a wave of Christian nationalism into the highest office in the land. Uh, if you look at what the number one factor Indicating somebody who would be a Trump voter. What was the best predictor of a Trump voter? Most people would say it was religion. Uh, You know, white evangelicals voted for Trump in droves. Uh, Most people would say it was political party. Republicans voted for Trump overwhelmingly. Neither of those was the best indicator. The best indicator was whether or not somebody thought that the United States was founded as a Christian nation. Uh, Solid research done on that point. But this is, this idea now is really infecting everything. These lies are driving public policy. Uh, We've seen it in education policy with Betsy DeVos trying to dismantle public schools, in immigration policy with the Muslim ban, civil rights, LGBTQ rights, women's rights, minority rights, uh, our foreign policy. The move of the embassy to Jerusalem was done for on the basis of Christian nationalism. The attempt to redefine religious freedom as a license to discriminate also a a, a strain of Christian nationalism. We are seeing this now working its way into decisions that justices of the Supreme Court and other federal courts are making. I mean, put simply, these these lies really are, they're destroying our country and they're gnawing away at our liberty. And I think we have a duty to stand up to those lies and to the bullies who are promoting them. I had uh, Todd in the chat who was asking about Trump and Pence and the impact it's having on those leaving the church. Could a wave of secular, not necessarily atheist, political and legal activism undo Christian nationalism? I don't know. It's a broad question, but I mean, is Trump Pence driving the fundamentalists in or is it pushing people away or both? 
I think it's polarizing. Absolutely. And I, we certainly can undo it, uh, but we, we have to, number one, recognize it for the threat that it is. Uh, and there are signs that that is happening. Uh, there was a morning consult poll that came out uh, just last month where 47% of the country said that Christian nationalism was a threat or a serious threat to America, which is a huge jump and massive progress. But we also have to have the tools to refute Christian nationalism and and the ideas and the identity that is Christian nationalism. And that's really what I try to do in the founding myth. I outline all of the different lies and myths. And I don't just refute them with facts, which is important, but that's been done by other books. I also give the reader a ton of new arguments that they can use to completely undercut these lies and myths. You get into patriotism. I mean, I say I like I like to think you know, I'm a patriot. I mean, I love my country. I, I love oh, yeah. what it stands for. I love it in sometimes in the abstract, not so much in practice, depending on what endeavors it's uh, you know in the middle of at that time. But you know, if you say patriotism, some people I've noticed in the atheist movement tend to wig out a little bit, and they're like, you know, why would you be? Why would you love one country? And then they usually jump into over another. Or why would you be a nationalist yeah. or why would you be an isolationist or whatever? And sure. I don't necessarily conflate those terms. Talk to me about patriotism and recital. Sure. I don't think patriotism and nationalism are the same thing at all. I, I, and and I, you've kind of honed in on really one of the central aspects here. You know, patriotism has no religion. And the Christian nationalist seeks to change that. that. I mean, really, at its most basic, that is what this is a fight. This fight is about. It is about what it is to be an American. And they are seeking to define an American as a Christian and a Christian as an American, uh, vice versa. And then once they've successfully redefined that, they are going to change the laws and our public policy accordingly. And you, you, you can already see the change happening. And I think that some people's distaste to be patriotic is actually a symptom that they have been successful, right? Like, A lot of people, when they think of patriotism, they associate it with, uh, you know, American flag shorts and sandals and tattoos and Christian nationalism. And, and, And to me, that is that successfully that shows that the Christian nationalists have been successful in starting to redefine what it is to be an American and to to be a patriot. And that is not a fight that we can afford to lose. And that's one of the reasons that I wrote this book. You say patriotism and somebody says, oh, yeah, they're in the MAGA hat. That's patriotism yeah. in the 21st century. And, I'm, it, and it's tough because you can love your country, but also support and even love other countries slash cultures slash people all around the world. You can of course. want to see your own nation elevated while we elevate everybody else. I mean, I don't think it's an, an exclusive thing, right? I, I agree completely. I've, I've traveled all around the world, um, you know, many different countries, Cuba, Brazil, South Africa, Tanzania, India, Japan. Uh, and, and we live in a fairy tale here. We are incredibly, incredibly lucky uh, to, to live in, in the United States. But I, I don't think I don't think because the MAGA hats are are popular and are are patriotic that we should cede that ground. I don't think that that's something that we should agree to. I think we ought to push back against that narrative. And and that's, to me, that is absolutely critical. Looks like I have an international call. I'm just going to jump into this real quick and let's see what we can come up with. It looks like an area code 44. You're on the Thinking Atheist podcast with Andrew Seidel. Who's this? Hello, it's Rosemary. Rosemary, it's so nice to speak with you. What do you have for the show? Question or comment? Um, a question. Uh, what do you think of this new Georgia law that allows um, women to be um, jailed for, you know, having an abortion? It's it's a draconian law. It's deliberately draconian. It okay, is let's a explain clear... it for those who might be coming. Okay. Forgive the interruption, but let me set no, it up for ahead. a little bit who may be looking yeah. for context here. Go ahead. Well, uh, it's essentially, it's, I saw uh, AOC was saying it was a de facto six week abortion ban, and I think that's pretty accurate. It is uh, it is putting into place. I like the word draconian measures, which really play into the religious narrative that life begins at the moment of conception, and therefore that the elimination of those cells is a, is murder, and it has been banned 
um, this is indicative of the thinking in southern states. And I believe it's hugely uh, anti-human rights, anti-women's rights, and, and unconstitutional, and yet it's been held up in, in Georgia. I don't know. You're the attorney. Elaborate on that for me and let me know what no, I missed. I, I, think you, I think you hit the nail on the head. I was actually having a few conversations on Twitter about this very law just before we started here. And the last point that you made, I think, is one of the most uh, poignant that maybe hasn't been covered quite as much. It is unconstitutional. And, and, and they know it's unconstitutional. And in fact... They pass the law because it's unconstitutional. They believe that they have the votes on the Supreme Court to overturn Roe versus Wade. So what you're seeing happening is these conservative legislatures across the country passing laws that roll back women's rights in accordance with their religious beliefs, mind you, so that eventually those laws get challenged in court, struck down in court, and those challenges work their way up to the U.S. Supreme Court, which then in turn strikes down Roe versus Wade, which guaranteed a woman's right to choose. That is why they are doing this. I see a comment from Will. Stick with me, Rosemary. He said, does our guest think this issue might have something to do with the leave it to beaver, white picket fence, post-World War II economic boom, and the general impression, I'm sorry, it's moving quickly, and the general impression that this was a church-going era I don't know if that's, I mean, it's the Norman Rockwell painting, which is our supposed squeaky clean, safe, and amazingly Mm -hmm. pure past, right? Well, I mean, it's golden age thinking to a certain extent, for sure. But there is, you know, I have a whole chapter in the book on the 1950s, uh, because this was an era where not only we were going through the Red Scare and the nation was was really afraid, uh, but where religion was deliberately being sold to the public, as a way to push back against the New Deal. And and this is built on the work that uh, Kevin Cruz, the Princeton historian, has done in his book, One Nation Under God. And I put it in the context of a chapter where I'm looking at the phrase under God being added to the pledge. Uh, This was also the time period when the National Day of Prayer statute was passed. It was when In God We Trust was added to our paper money. It was... um, when the uh, prayer room was built in the U.S. Capitol. So it, it's, it's a time where we saw a lot of these incursions of religion and really Christian nationalism into the U.S. government. And I use a sort of a metaphor throughout the book about Christian nationalism and fighting back against these violations of the separation of state and church. And one of the problems we face is that they act like a ratchet or a noose. So once you lose one of these violations and it happens, it's really, really difficult to win that ground back. It, it, the ratchet tightens one click, the news tightens a little bit, and it's very, very difficult to get things going back in the other direction. Rosemary, where do you hail from? Where are you calling in from? I'm from the northeast of England. So when you look across the um, pond at all of us Americans, what do you think? What's going on in your head? Um, Be kind. The evangelical, <laughs> well, the, if the uh, evangelical, evangelical right, I just saw, you know, all the bits of the Bible that say that it's, you know, um, abortion, forced abortions, uh, you know, in numbers when God told Moses that if a man suspects his wife of um, having an affair, just suspects, he takes it down to the um the priest and they will he will give her some you know water some um magic whatever it is ingredients and if she aborts then obviously she become barren and she was you know uh, guilty but and and you know i mean all the all the like god the being biggest abortionist you know with the, the flood and I, I, I just wait for you Americans. I'm, I'm sorry to say. I told that story. We did, uh, was it um, Seth Andrews Teaches Sunday School? It was a uh, podcast we did where we talked about the edict about how she had to be dragged down before the council. Then the woman drinks the bitter water. And then if she's been an adulteress, that the, the baby spills out of her. It's just a v- horrifying set of verses. And then, I, you know, in my own life, I brought this to the attention of believers and they're like, well, that's not in the Bible. And of course, this is another great example where we know the Bible better than they do. And then if I show them, it's like they just flip a switch. They, they don't 
they still won't accept that it's there. It's usually like you took it out of context or it's metaphor or it was a different time or there's a, there's a reason why this is moral. I just can't think of what it is. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. God's the abortion doctor, right? Uh, how many clusters of cells have been essentially discharged or aborted out of a woman's body well before they, you know, it ever took hold. And I think, well, that God is the biggest abortion doctor of all time. So it's hugely hypocritical for people in the faith to chide Yahweh or, or rather chide the rest of us for doing what Yahweh's been doing for, you know, since recorded history, if Yahweh had existed. Rosemary, thanks for the call and be safe out there. We'll talk soon. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Rosemary. All right. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. Take care. Uh, let's see on the uh, switchboard, 440. Hey, Seth. Who's this? This is Lauren. Lauren. We met at uh, Northern Ohio Free Thought a year ago. Oh, yeah. That was, uh, was that Akron? That uh, was, well, north of Akron, yeah, Cuyahoga yeah, yeah. Falls or Fairlawn or wherever it was. Lauren, what's going um, on? What do you want to say? You got a comment or question? Yeah, well, uh, I mean, first of all, regarding the whole business in Georgia, I mean, we just went through the same thing here in Ohio, which I find extremely disturbing. I mean, because you and I both know that the primary focus of these bills is to go up to the Supreme Court and see whether or not they can get five votes to rule against Roe v. Wade. Now, I've got an interesting point of view on this in that, uh, as it comes to the whole abortion thing, if you want to turn the whole business on its head, uh, interesting story. My mom had a, uh, a miscarriage between when I showed up and when my uh, sister showed up. And the reason why she had a miscarriage is because my dad is blood type A positive. My mom is O negative. And there's a phenomenon known as RH mismatch that is problematic and has probably given rise to more miscarriages throughout history than anything I can hope to think of. Sometime between the time when that happened and now, uh, something was invented called Rogam. And Rogam stops the process whereby those uh, miscarriages happen. Question, were those miscarriages owing to God's will or were they simply a physiological phenomenon that uh, you know, that just happens? You know, but because if if it's the first, then we're frustrating God. Oh my goodness! <laughs> <laughs> Lauren, well, these are this is a philosophical question, I, I guess. Um, as we talk, yeah. but, but it does speak. But, to... But the thing is, it plays to the whole. It plays to the whole business of uh, you know. God, you know, basically legislating God. And that's and, what they're looking to do. And, and you're absolutely right about that. And, th- and that is one of the central creeds of the Christian nationalist is I get to legislate my religion, my Judeo-Christian principles, and use the machinery of the state to impose them on everybody else. And so, you know, one of the primary things that I really looked at in this book, the central question that I asked was, did Judeo-Christian principles positively influence the founding of the United States? And the answer to that is no, they did not. You know, America was not founded on Judeo-Christian principles, and it's a good thing that it wasn't. Uh, And especially when we're talking about those principles that are central to the Christian nationalist identity. And I go, I take it one step further, which is to say that not only was America not founded on the Judeo-Christian values, but that those values and principles are so opposed to the values that America was founded on that it's fair to say that Judeo-Christianity is un-American. And, and that's the kind of the central point that I really try to make in the book. And it's, it's the point that I think that makes this book different than some other Christian nation books, because I'm not just mm-hmm. trotting out facts. I'm also going after their identity and giving you new arguments to, to use against the people who would uh, impose their religion using our state houses and our uh, the U.S. Capitol and the courts, etc. Lauren, I appreciate yeah. you. Anything else, my friend? Well, just the point that, I mean, just as surely as reading the Bible tends to make people into atheists, why not read the Constitution and recognize <laughs> that the Constitution has nothing to do with God? I really I, wish people would, The closest would, thing you come is Article 6, Paragraph 3, No Religious Test, the the First Amendment, and you know, uh, getting outside the Constitution, the you know Article Article Eleven of the Treaty of Tripoli, you know, the United being that the United States is in no way founded on the Christian religion, blah 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 blah. 
This is established law. Hello. All right. All right. All right. Just breathe. Take <laughs> Lamaze, align your chakras. Uh, you to vibrate in the positive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you, Lauren. You take Thanks care. Thanks for your right. time, Seth. All right. Take care. It's funny, as he was uh, speaking, I pulled up the uh, meme about Christian marriage, and it says this. Oh, yeah. I'm not going to pull it up. It was man plus woman, man plus wives plus concubines, and, of course, there are uh, uh, accompanying scriptures, uh, references, man plus woman plus woman's property, man plus woman plus woman plus woman, man plus brother's widow, a rapist and his victim, a male soldier plus a prisoner of war, male slave, plus female slave. Biblical marriage is very, very dark whenever we actually look at yeah. the literal words of the Bible. So let's talk about this. Biblical values, Christian morality. I've heard this argument before. I think I most recently heard it when they were talking about, I think it was Rapert in Arkansas, was talking about how Christianity provides the moral <clears throat> framework for the United States. Can we speak about that? Absolutely. And I have a couple of chapters in the book on this. Um, so, I mean, well, more broadly, it might help for people to understand sort of the structure of the book. So, you know, in investigating that claim, did Judeo-Christian principles positively influence the founding? I broke it down into sort of U.S. history that happened uh, before the Constitution. So things like the Puritan and Pilgrim settlements, the Mayflower Compact, stuff like that. The Declaration of Independence gets a couple chapters. The religion or lack thereof of the Founding Fathers gets a couple chapters, including a, a big emphasis on their views about religion and morality and how they may or may not have impacted the Founding. Um, I think those are the that particular chapter on morality is probably one of the most important ones because that argument that you just made that that Raper I, I didn't see him doing that, but I have no doubt that he was. Um, is one of the hardest things for people to push back against. And it's really critical to be able to do that. That's why I included it in the book. Um, and then I have a whole section on actual biblical principles like um, hell and vicarious redemption and obedience and the golden rule, which, you know, whether or not that's a Judeo-Christian principle, we can talk about more. And then a whole section on the Ten Commandments. I go through each of the Ten Commandments and talk about whether, uh, examine them to see if they conflict or influenced American foundation. And then finally, uh, what I call American verbiage or argument by idiom in God, we trust God bless America. All those fun ones to end the book. It's a full oh, man. It was a long time. It took like 10 years to write this guy. You know, I, I know you've been working on it a while. Cause we've been talking yeah. about it a while. Yeah. So I'm in, you know, I was a kid in private Christian school <laughs> and I look back at it and the level of revisionist history that took place mm. is it's cult ish. No, it's, it's just a cult. I mean, it was, you know, George Washington never told a lie. He was a mm -hmm. saint, right? You know, I chopped down the cherry tree. I'm a very, very, very young child being for the first time introduced to one of our founding fathers. And what you have is this sort of sainthood anointed to a man, a good Christian man who uh, was our first president and who, upheld the righteousness that God wanted for an American leader. And then you have all of the others. And of course, all of our founders were believers in the Christian God and mm -hmm. held to the Christian Bible. And they founded this nation as a Christian nation. I remember you, I, when I was much younger and stupid, I remember saying that, you know, you can't separate church and state because without the church, there is no state. That's how heavily brainwashed I was as a Christian youth. And I think to myself, I knew nothing about the Founding Fathers. And yet when I go and have conversations now with people who talk about, you know, Thomas Paine, uh, John Adams, Jefferson, whoever, um, they remain, number one, ignorant of the facts, but two, hugely convinced that these were not mm -hmm. just deistic God believers, but Christian theists, correct? Yes. I, I mean, there's a huge thread of that running around and there are there are tons and tons of books written on this and like i said i devote a couple chapters to it george washington's a great example you know and in fact the myth about him um but not being able to tell a lie after he chopped down a cherry tree that comes from a book written by a guy named mason weems who was a parson actually he was a religious leader and uh he wrote his book on washington specifically to sell 
He did not care about historical truth at all. We know the story about the cherry tree is made up. And this is the same guy who gave us the myth about Washington praying in the snow at Valley Forge, which now hangs in the Capitol prayer room in the United States Capitol building, which is kind of amazing. Didn't happen, just like the cherry tree thing didn't happen. I mean, and Washington is, is again, he's a great example. You know, he didn't take, when he did go to church, he didn't take communion. He went to church rarely. He rarely, maybe once or twice, referenced Jesus in his personal personal letters and the thousands and thousands of pages of personal letters that we have. Uh, He was on his deathbed for quite a while. Uh, Could have easily called for uh, some religious solace, uh, could have had taken last rites, specifically did not want to do that. I mean, and generally didn't talk about religion publicly at all. Certainly not his personal religion. So this, this is a guy where, by all intents and purposes, if he is religious, is very, very private about it. Certainly never used his religion as a political weapon. Have you um, um, gotten it all into the Jefferson Bible? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, I, and, and so I, the, the main point that I try to make, though, is that this is a fascinating question, and it's really interesting, and I love having that argument, but that it actually doesn't matter, right? Their personal religious beliefs do not matter. You, to show that they are relevant to the argument the Christian nationalist is making, that the Christian nationalist still has to do two things. One, they have, that, they have to prove first that they are Christians, which is very, very difficult to do. Second, they have to prove that that religion then influenced the founding of the United States, which none of them try to connect to those dots. And three, they have to go to great lengths to show that they didn't want state and church separate. And that is simply not possible. I mean, the founders were very clear. They were more unified on this subject than they were on others, that religion and government would be better off not mixed together. And and to me, that is the central argument that we need to be having when we're talking about the founders. We shouldn't be engaging on the, yeah, they were they were deists. They were they would have been atheists today um, as a, fighting back against the, the idea that they were Christian. We should not be engaging on that. It really doesn't matter to the central point. That we are and the central fight that we are trying to have. Does it not, though, speak to intent? I mean, the intent of the founders was this. It was driven by well, a look, personal belief. What yeah, look, like if you are, if you're like, let's, I, I use a couple examples in the book that religious ideas don't claim ownership over every other idea generated by that particular mind. Right. Uh, the, the guys who invented blue jeans were Jewish, but we don't go around calling them Jewish blue jeans. <laughs> right. Like, it makes it makes no sense to do that. And the same thing with vaccines. You know, we don't go calling them Jewish vaccines. You know, they're just vaccines. You ha- they still would have to prove that those principles, the Judeo-Christian principles or Christian principles, influence the founding of the United States, which is the, the argument that this book takes on and disproves. And, and you simply can't successfully make that argument because Judeo-Christian principles are so fundamentally opposed to the Enlightenment principles on which the United States was built that it's fair to say that Judeo-Christianity is un-American. So the founders come here to escape the overreach of a church-state government, right? The Church of England. They come here and in the Declaration of Independence, they do mention God, yes. I mean, some people bring that up as an argument. Hey, look, they invoke God in their Declaration of Independence from the Church of England. Yeah, the Declaration is a really popular argument for the Christian nationalists. Um, so I devoted two chapters in the book to that. Um, the, the, I mean, there are a couple things to note. There are four basic references that people use, Christian nationalists use, to try to make this argument. Um, The laws of nature and of nature is God, their creator, uh, divine providence, and the supreme judge of the world. First thing we should note is none of those is Christian. Uh, The laws of nature and of nature is God, if anything, to me, that sounds pagan, not not Christian. Uh, The only one of those that is in the Bible is creator, uh, which is also something that's unique to, or not unique to any religion. Every religion pretty much centers around this creator belief. So these are not we can't call them even Judeo-Christian references. At best, they are they are very, very deistic at best. Um, but there's another thing to note, which is that two of those were only added later uh, at the very end of the drafting process. But to me, the, the bigger question here is, I, or the bigger point is that I try to make, is that the Declaration of Independence is an anti-biblical document. You know, it is specifically rebelling against a government 
and dissolving the political ties against the government. Uh, mind you, King George was the, the defender of the faith and the head of the Anglican Church, too. And you couldn't do that and be a devout Bible-believing Christian at the same time. You know, the Bible says that uh, in Romans 13, it says that the rulers here on earth were ordained by God. And if the founders had believed that, they would not have rebelled against King George in the first place. The Declaration, the fact that it is a document that rebels, makes it inherently anti-biblical. Again, we see this fundamental conflict between the values of the United States and the values of Judeo-Christianity. Quick break when I come right back with attorney and author Andrew Seidel. We're going to talk about the Red Scare and how our leaders back in the 1950s were using the threat, quote unquote, threat of communism to help sell Christianity and Christian privilege here in the USA. It's the Red Scare and it's coming up next. Hang on. Mother's Day 2019 is in the can. Father's Day next month. And I have so got you covered because I am one of the 10 million people who have tried Harry's. I talk about him on the broadcast. I love the Harry shaving experience and I've given Harry shave sets as gifts to the people in my own life because they're awesome. Now, if you're not familiar with Harry's, we are talking about a company that bought a world-class blade factory in Germany and streamlined the often overpriced and over-designed model for a close, comfortable shave. Harry's skips the gimmicks, stuff like the flex balls and the vibrating heads and that stuff, and they've made a quality shave cost-efficient. In fact, Harry's replacement blades are just $2 each. That is half the price of the Gillette Fusion Pro Shield. Harry's blades have a 100% quality guarantee, and whether you're buying for yourself or for Father's Day or birthday or anniversary or whatever day, you can get a $13 value trial set that comes with everything you need for a close, comfortable shave. A weighted ergonomic handle, a five-blade razor with lubricating strip and trimmer blade, rich lathering shave gel, a travel blade cover. Listeners of my show can redeem their trial set with this URL. Go to harrys.com slash the thinking atheist. Make sure you go to harrys.com slash the thinking atheist to redeem your offer and let them know that I sent you to help support the show. Harrys.com slash the thinking atheist. My patrons get this show early. They get it commercial free. And if you're not a patron, I would encourage you to consider becoming one. Your support's always appreciated. Patreon.com slash Seth Andrews. Talking here with Andrew Seidel of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. He is a constitutional attorney. I mean, is that how I say it? I, uh, you're a, Obviously, you do a lot of work in that specific area. How do I frame that? Constitutional yeah, attorney? Yeah, that's that's fine. Constitutional attorney, civil rights attorney. Uh, yeah, both and of those. author of The Founding Myth. So um, I'm watching this documentary by Ken Burns called The Vietnam War, and they get into the fear of communism uh, spreading across Asia and the implications. And so they conflate communism with Satan or Satanism. The great Satan is coming, you know. Mm-hmm. And so, therefore, we must go out and have 50 plus thousand American lives lost and I think a million plus Vietnamese lives lost in a war that accomplished pretty much nothing. And you see a prime example of how this sort of fear of a supernatural agent which they really did. They thought communism was part of the great evil that was coming to encroach upon us. And we saw then the rise of under God in the pledge and on paper money. I don't know. Talk to me about that. You get into that in the book. I do. So I have a whole chapter on the 1950s. It's in that final section of the book that looks at God bless America and one nation under God and God we trust all that. And, you know, I think probably, especially a lot of your listeners and viewers probably feel pretty good about 
pushing back against that narrative that we are uh, one nation under God or that we do trust in God. They probably can even cite the years that those uh, phrases entered or were put on our money or were added to the pledge. Uh, and, but, but to me, again, that's not enough. You know, it's not enough for us to just restate the facts and push back on the facts. If that were enough, Donald Trump wouldn't have ridden this wave of Christian nationalism into the Oval Office. The facts aren't enough. We have to push back with stronger arguments than we've used in the past. And that's what I tried to do in this book. So I make kind of two big, broad points that sort of apply to all of those different phrases. And I I tease this out certainly more carefully in the book. But the, the first point is that a lot of those phrases that we see added, these religious phrases, replaced or modified unifying phrases. So one nation indivisible. It's a, it's, it's a beautiful sentiment. It really is. You know, we are this one nation. You cannot divide us, especially when you think that this was, uh, this idea was drafted, at, you know, it, within a few decades after the Civil War. Um, you're taking then religion, which is historically the most divisive force in human history, and literally dividing the indivisible with religion. One nation indivisible becomes one nation under God indivisible. Uh, you see the same thing happening with adding in God we trust to the money in, during the height of the Civil War. It's not just that they were using the machinery of the state to push their own religion. It's that they were deliberately erasing unifying sentiments to promote their personal God. So the de facto U.S. motto, which was e pluribus unum, from many one, from many people, one country, <clears throat> from many states, one nation. You see that being erased in favor of this very exclusionary motto, in God we trust. So that's, I think, one of the big points that we need to be doing a better job of pushing back on, say, showing that this was an attempt to, it was an attempt to divide using religion. Yeah, I see that whenever I see the... Um uh, when I'm watching down in Florida and they have in God we trust displayed in schools as a response to the shootings, I'm not sure if it's supposed to protect them or bring them back to God, which is sort of a de facto blaming of the school system for the violence carried out against students. But mostly I just see exclusion. In God we trust, a student looks up and sees those four words, and if they don't worship a specific God or they are a non-believer in gods, they are automatically then sort of communicated to that it, you're sort of not part of the in-group, you're not part of the A-team. Yeah, it, it is literally you are a second-class citizen. It is meant it is meant to favor Christianity and make everybody else second-class citizens. And, and that's what I mean when I say that Christian nationalism is trying to redefine what it is to be an American. That is that is exactly the kind of thing that I'm talking about. And it's not just that they deliberately wiped out these unifying mottos in favor of these exclusionary and alienating mottos. They also did it during times of national fear and strife when nobody could fight back. You know, you mentioned the 1950s and we've been talking about that. That was a time during the Red Scare where it would have been it would have been career suicide for a lot of people to say, hey, we actually shouldn't have under God and the pledge and force kids to say this. We actually shouldn't be using the government to promote Christianity uh, because you, I mean, you could have been hauled up in front of Congress to answer questions about godless communism. But again, it's not, and it's also not just about godless communism. This was also a time when the big business in the country of the time was deliberately trying to sell religion to the nation, uh, which is another part of the narrative that our movement has not been a good job of done a good job of describing. I've got on the switchboard a caller, area code 937. You're on the Thinking Atheist podcast. Who's this? Just call me Mitch. I'm from Ohio and a big fan of the show. So I thought the uh, U.S. Constitution was got the ideals from the uh, ideas of the Enlightenment. Mm-hmm. Yes, you're, you're correct. Absolutely. I mean, and the Constitution is is a perfect example of kind of what, what I'm talking about throughout the whole book. It is an entirely godless document. You know, Lauren, the earlier call, your caller mentioned that two times it, it discusses religion, Article 6, where it bans religious tests from pub, for public office, and the First Amendment, where it says Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, which effectively keeps state and church separate, keeps religion out of government and government out of religion. Those are the only times that religion are mentioned. God does not get a mention. This is a deliberately godless document. It was criticized at the time 
for being a deliberately godless document. There have been a number of attempts to amend it throughout the years to include God in the preamble. So instead of saying we the people, uh, it would say we the people believing that Jesus is Lord or something along those lines. All those attempts have been shot down. There was a big attempt in the 1950s, actually, since we were just talking about that as well. But yeah, the Constitution is this godless document, and it is it talks about the American experiment. You know, the, when the founders got together and they passed this, they were they talked about it as they were taking political science and they were putting it into practice in the American experiment, which is about as far from religion as you can get. All right, my friend. Anything else? Not really. So right. Thanks so much. Uh, Thanks, it's probably Mitch. another great example of religion borrowing the good stuff and then stamping the brand of ownership on it. You know, we've talked I think about, that, yeah, that happens so much, doesn't it? You know, I was talking, we were talking uh, with Gail Jordan about community and how, you know, anytime you gather together as any group, but especially as non-believers in God, atheists, rationalists, whatever, humanists, they say, oh, you're just doing church. And, you know, she's like, well, actually, I think church sort of was mimicking our tribes, our natural tendency to to have tribes. I've done a whole speech called The Copycats that talked about how mm-hmm. Christianity likes to find out what's popular or what's relevant. It grabs it, stamps its own brand on it. Uh, sometimes it's a cheap copy, sometimes not, and then says, we now own this. And uh, it's done the same with patriotism. It's done the same with um, our founding documents. It's done the same with our own national history, uh, saying that this is ours. It is not yours. So, Absolutely. Number one, I love Gail Jordan. She's just she's legendary. So the woman so is legendary. Yeah. I, and her I, her campaign was uh, it was semi inspiring, uh, truly inspiring. She's she's just an amazing woman, uh, amazing human. Period. Uh, and but you've really struck on something that uh, I, it was a theme that I noticed in the book, and it was something that I kept coming back to. Um, you know, I have a whole chapter devoted to the golden rule in the book because you'll see a lot of claims that well, the golden rule. The United States was founded on the Golden Rule, which is very clearly a Judeo-Christian principle, and it's not. This is a, this is a universal human principle that we've seen in just about every successful society. The idea of reciprocal, recipro- uh, reciprocal. <laughs> there it is, <laughs> reciprocal morality is it's it's, inc- it's it's a universal human impulse, and to claim it for religion is to rubber stamp something that belongs to all, all of us for for their religion, and it, it simply can't be done. Um, I also close out the book with with another kind of example of this, but that. That's exactly what Christian nationalism is doing. You're right. They, they are trying to take credit for enlightenment success and for the success of the American experiment and claim it for Judeo-Christianity when really their principles are fundamentally opposed to those on which this nation was founded. I'm going to put the uh, book link in the description box and I'm going to ask everybody, support the book read the book there's an audio book coming out in the summer is that right or and in the summer and sadly neither you nor i <laughs> got to narrate it this is a, a I was, crime i was half joking i'm like oh, i'm game you know call me have your people call me but you know they've got their own people at the publishing house and that's totally cool but um what it does is it sort of encapsulates and then expounds upon the um the basic stuff that you and I can then use in our conversations with the theocrats, with the apologists, with our next door neighbors, our coworkers who are all married to this narrative that's been sold so effectively by Christian culture that they own it. It's theirs. It's founded on their stuff. They get a little extra measure of privilege everywhere they go. You and I are just sick of it. And, uh, you know, we're not... We're not going to stand for it because, number one, it's we think it's morally wrong. But two, it's simply against the intent of the founders and the framework of the Constitution. Let me ask, how much do the like the religious politicians in that group, how much do they hate you right now? (laughs) 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 Because you're always out there, you know, you're always sort of pawing at the company. Hey, I'm over here. Don't forget me. Yes, I've got a copy of the Constitution. I would like to read it to you. You're that guy. And I wonder how much hate mail do you get how much pushback are you getting what's the temperature out there we get we get a lot of hate mail especially at, you know at the ffrf office we get a lot of hate mail um we do get a surprising amount of pushback from the governments themselves and i will say this you're seeing it we're seeing it more and more there is since the coming of trump and since the rise of christian nationalism as it really into the mainstream we have seen 
these politicians emboldened in a way, and not just the politicians, but the, the, the people on the other side of our cases. So the groups that are not like the Freedom From Religion Foundation or American Atheists or the American Humanist Association, but the groups that we litigate against all the time, they are emboldened. And I've, I've never seen it like this before. They, they feel entitled to win. They feel entitled to impose their religion on anybody else. And they are, they're angry when that gets pushed back on in a way that that we haven't seen before. It is, it's truly alarming. And not to interrupt, forgive me. No, go ahead. That was the end. I mean, do you feel like that there's scrambling, like there's a rush, right? Our guy is in the, he's in the top seat. So we got to go, go, go as quickly as we can to try to get all this to gain as much ground as we can, because we're watching statistically the rise yes. of the non-religious, right? I mean, you and I have both seen the same stats. Was it 23 point something percent of polled Americans? About a quarter of polled Americans don't affiliate with any religion. Doesn't make them atheists. But we're seeing the statistic continuing to rise and the evangelicals are starting to to drift. You can feel them begin to panic. Does that drive much of what you're seeing? Absolutely. Uh, and, and, and there's sort of two things that are happening there. There's one... They're, they were surprised when 2016 went the way it did. Um, nobody was expecting Christian nationalism to just break onto the mainstream the way that it did. And they kind of had to rush to catch up to that. And now they're in, in overdrive trying to make up for that, that one year of lost time when uh, from the beginning of 2016 till whenever they started Project Blitz. And now... Because the demo, they see the demographics changing so rapidly. I call it they're raging against the di- you know raging against the dying of the light. They're raging against the dying of their privilege. They the end is in sight for them, and they are desperately trying to cling to that little bit of privilege that they have, and to, to the extent that they can to augment it. And the, the amazing thing about that is that it's in at least. I think it is creating this feedback loop where those actions, these ridiculous bills in Ohio and Georgia, uh, you know, they're trying to impose in God we trust on every school student in Florida and things like that. They are driving young people away from the church, which is then feeding the demographics, which is then feeding the fear and getting them to do these stupid things. And so you're seeing this kind of ridiculous feedback loop that's actually going to push more and more people away from religion. I love it. You know, the 30 and others are like, we don't need it. You know, I mean, even the ones who say, well, I'm spiritual, but not religious. I'm not bothered by any of that. I mean, you know, I wish they were more rational, but it's the fundamentalists. It's the people who were trying to change our laws and strip the rights away from people and exercise privilege. Those are the people my fights against. So, yeah, the spiritual, not religious people are not trying to use their lies to drive public policy (laughs) and litigating cases and Uh, So they they don't worry me in the slightest, but the Christian nationalists uh, terrify the hell out of me. Well, you have a uh, prediction for 2020? I mean, like if (laughs) if I'm seeking the rational candidate. Gail Jordan, 2020. I, I agree totally. Uh, you know, you'd mentioned she had, uh, was it a, forgive me, was it a state election? She was running for a yeah. Senate seat or uh, remind me. Um, uh, she, she, I don't remember whether it was a Senate or assembly seat, uh, but it was in ten, it was in Tennessee yeah. and it was, she was running as an out atheist, um, as a liberal in this state. And she just ran, it was just a beautiful campaign. Well, talk it was really about, wonderful. Though, you talk about Christian privilege. What was used against her in the oh, campaign? Yeah was yeah. almost party line Christian rhetoric. She's trying to kill God. She's trying to kill our values. She is, uh, you know, she holds some frightening. I mean, the language used, I guess, strategically, obviously strategically uh, against her was that that promoted the fear of the other and the fear of Satan or evil, the non-Christian. It was Christian privilege that informed and permeated the campaigns against her. They didn't even bother to try to represent her accurately. Oh, no, no. And, and, and why do that when you can fear monger and make them the other, which is something that religion itself excels at. If you are afraid of Gail Jordan, <laughs> you know, you got you need to you need to see someone, you know, you need to go and reprioritize your life. Um, all right, my friend. Well, uh, just in a nutshell, put a, you know, an exclamation point on our conversation about the book. I'd like to just push people in that direction to support it, read it, listen to it, promote it, just get it out there and then use it as a resource and a tool in our discussions with people who have bought the lie about the founding of America as a Christian nation. I mean, I think that's, I think that's really kind of what I'm trying to do is I'm, I'm not, I'm not, 
it's very unlikely that I'm going to convince any Christian nationalists with this book. But well, I'm, I'm seeking to do two things. I'm, I'm one, I'm hoping to arm our side with the arguments they need to defeat and shout down the Christian nationalists. And then two, hoping to wake up that big chunk of the middle that it doesn't really understand how serious a threat Christian nationalist is, Christian nationalism is. But I mean, the political theology of Christian nationalism, the very identity of the Christian nationalist depends on the myths that I expose in this book. The idea that we are founded as a Christian nation is central to their hold on political power in America. And without the historical support many of their policy justifications are going to crumble. Without their common well of myths, many, their identity is going to wither. Uh, their entire political and ideological reality is incredibly weak and vulnerable but because it's based on these lies. And my goal, the purpose of this book, the simple purpose, it's lofty but simple, is to utterly destroy the myths that underlie this un-American political ideology. He's a myth buster. <laughs> there you go. Recital. Of the FFRF, and he is. Uh, I'm glad you're on our side, man. Glad you're on the side <laughs> of reason and the Constitution and all that good stuff. I'm going to link the book in the description box, or you can find it on Amazon and all the usual places. Support it, get it. Andrew, I will see you out there on the road, my friend. All my best with the book and with the fight, okay? Thank you very much, Seth. I truly appreciate it. I really do. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. For a complete archive of podcasts and videos, products like mugs and t-shirts featuring the Thinking Atheist logo, links to atheist pages and resources, and details on upcoming free thought events and conventions, log on to our website, thethinkingatheist.com.